A Boeing 737 on approach to Los Angeles burst into flames on the runway in the evening of February 1st, 1991. Flames engulfed the plane, to which the airport fire department quickly arrives mere moments later. For a second, just try to imagine the chaos which had just unfolded from the perspective of those on the ground at the scene. No one would have any idea as to why this plane caught fire. But now, try to imagine the sense of disbelief one would have from attending to a burning jetliner when a propeller is found at the site. To those on the ground, it became apparent that there were in fact two planes in the wreckage. 35 people were killed in what became the Los Angeles runway disaster. How and why were there two planes on the same runway at the same time? And what improvements has the airport made since the disaster? The event which occurred at Los Angeles on that February evening in 1991 is what is known as a runway incursion. A runway incursion can be defined in a multiple of different ways, but those in the industry can agree it can be defined as where two or more planes or other vehicles occupy the same runway or intersecting runways where a collision may occur. These events can be incredibly dangerous and extremely deadly. In fact, the deadliest aviation accident to ever occur was a runway incursion event which occurred on the island of Tenerife. Two Boeing 747s collided on the runway resulting in the deaths of 583 people. Despite major advances in technology, runway incursions still occur and on a more frequent basis than some may realize. One airport which is a prime offender is Los Angeles International or LAX. Throughout the 20th century, the city of Los Angeles saw massive expansion American urban sprawl has made this one of the largest and most populated metropolitan areas in the world, second in the United States behind New York City. LAX Airport is also an exceptionally large airport. It is the only international airport in the United States in the modern day, which is a hub for all major US airlines. Congestion has always been an issue here, both in the skies above Southern California and on the ground at LAX itself. In 1991, there were four runways at LAX, of which all still exist today, all of which we use for takeoff and landing. On the south side, there are two parallel runways facing westward, runway 25 left and 25 right. And on the north side, the two runways here are marked as runway 24 left and 24 right. It was on this north side, on runway 24 left, that the fatal runway incursion at LAX occurred. In this video, we will break down the events which led up to this disaster. The incident in question involved two planes, US Air Flight 1493, a Boeing 737-300 with 89 people on board, and SkyWest Flight 5569, a small Fairchild Metroliner commuter plane with just 12 people on board, making a short trip to Palmdale Regional Airport, Southern California. The US Air Flight had been flying a long trip from Syracuse, New York, making multiple stops along the way throughout the day. Flight 1493's final destination was San Francisco, making stopovers in Washington DC, Columbus, Ohio, and Los Angeles. The US Air Flight was uneventful for the entirety of its journey until the very last moments as the plane was beginning to decelerate on the runway at Los Angeles, where the plane suddenly collided with SkyWest Flight 5569 at its rear. We need to examine the final moments at the airport to understand how the SkyWest plane ended up on the runway and why no one could see the plane. The time was before 6pm in the evening of February 1st, 1991. SkyWest Flight 5569 is preparing for departure out of Los Angeles International Airport. The first leg of their trip that evening was to Palmdale Regional Airport just 50 miles northeast of Los Angeles. There were a total of 12 people on board. The captain on this flight was Andrew Lucas, age 32. He's a rather experienced pilot with over 8,000 flight hours, over 2,000 of which were in this plane, the Fairchild Metroliner. He is accompanied by his first officer, Frank Prentice, aged 45, also an experienced pilot with again around 8,000 flying hours. Before they ever get to the runway, the crew of Flight 5569 will need to contact multiple air traffic controllers at LAX, the first of which was clearance delivery. A dedicated controller on their own frequency will give clearance of flight information to the pilots as filed. The pilots will read this clearance back to the controller so that there is an understanding between the plane and the tower of the plane's after takeoff departing instructions. Once clearance is given, they will then contact Los Angeles ground controllers. Flight 5569 will then be given directions to their departing runway of 24 left. The controller will issue a set of taxi instructions of which taxiway should be used and which runway entrance to take. 
While SkyWest Flight 5569 is preparing for their departure, up in the sky, US Air Flight 1493 is beginning their final approach into LAX onto runway 24 left. In the flight deck on this plane is 48-year-old Captain Colin Shaw. He is a highly experienced captain with over 16,000 flight hours, around 4,300 of which have been in the Boeing 737 series of planes. His first officer that night was 32-year-old David Kelly. He is much less experienced on this plane with just under 1,000 hours logged on the 737. In total, however, he had accumulated over 4,300 hours in total. The crew of US Air 1493 tune into the Los Angeles Tower control frequency. The controllers on this frequency are responsible for handling all traffic which is ready for takeoff and on approach to a runway. On this evening, the controller handling the north side of LAX was Robin Lee Washer. She had been an air traffic controller for 9 years at that point and started working at LAX in 1989. SkyWest 5569 is taxiing down to runway 24 left. In 1991, it was not mandatory for small commuter planes such as this to carry a cockpit voice recorder or flight data recorder. This means the only data that we really have about this plane comes from ground data and the recorded ATC messages. Any conversation between the two pilots was never recorded. At 6.03pm, the crew of the small Metroliner decide to call Robin Washer in the tower and ask for departure from their current position. As the Metroliner is only a small plane, it does not need anywhere close to the full length of the runway, and so the pilots requested a taxi onto the runway from a nearer runway entrance to their current position. Washer tells them to hold position at this time. Another commuter flight, Wings West Flight 5006, had just landed on runway 24 right and needs to cross 24 left in order to get to the terminal. At 6.04 and 11 seconds, controller Robin Washer clears the Wings West flight to cross the runway while Sky West 5569 is on holding. The Wings West flight, however, does not respond to Robin Washer's instructions to cross the runway. Unknown to her at this moment, the crew of this flight had actually changed radio frequencies and were unaware of the tower's instructions so stayed on hold after vacating on runway 24 right. At 6.04 and 33 seconds, US Air Flight 1493 contacts Los Angeles Tower. They get no response from Robin Washer on this first transmission. During this time, she is juggling several other aircraft. Just ahead of US Air 1493 were several other planes including a Philippine Airlines Boeing 747, and that was on top of trying to re-establish communication with Wings West 5006, who had not been responding to her messages. Around 10 seconds later, Sky West Flight 5569 is cleared onto runway 24 left with an instruction to taxi into position and hold. This just means that the Metroliner is now cleared to move onto the runway and wait for further instructions. At this time, Robin Washer has not gotten back to US Air 1493. Captain Shaw on the US Air flight was the one handling the radio communications. He needs to get landing clearance before they can land. If not, they may need to go around and try another approach. Passing through 1,000 feet, US Air Flight 1493 is on short final and still does not have landing clearance. It is not uncommon at busy airports for landing clearance to be given late on. So long as they do receive it, they can land. At 6.05 and 9 seconds, Wings West 5006 comes back on frequency with Robin Washer, to which she then clears the Wings West flight to finally cross runway 24 left and head to their terminal. 24 seconds later, US Air 1493 tries again with establishing communication with Los Angeles Tower. Robin Washer still has her hands full responding to other aircraft. It would take her a further 22 seconds to respond to US Air 1493. In that time, she had been communicating with Southwest Airlines Flight 725, which was also holding short on runway 24 left. Eventually, at 6.05 and 51 seconds, Robin Washer clears US Air 1493 for landing to which the US Air Flight quickly responds with the readback of their landing clearance. All the while, SkyWest 5569 is still on runway 24 left and has been waiting for takeoff clearance for just over a minute. From Robin Washer's position, she cannot easily see the Metroliner on the runway. At the time, it was required that when a plane is on a runway, a minimum of a plane's green and red navigation lights be lit, along with the red rotating beacon light, which on the Metroliner is located on the tip of the tail fin. The flashing white strobe lights were not required. The glare of a ground floodlight was obstructing Washer's view of the runway. It was almost impossible to see the Sky West plane from a seat in the tower, let alone also concentrating on the activity of multiple other aircraft. 
It should be noted that the crew of the US Air Flight also cannot see the Metroliner on the runway. The plane is just too small with insufficient lighting to be seen. Investigators after the incident would later conduct an experiment where a Metroliner would be stationed on the runway at night, and the US Air approach would be recreated. The result was that the Metroliner could not have been easily seen to a pilot. At 6.06 and 8 seconds, another plane radios in on frequency. Wings West Flight 5072 radioed in ready for takeoff. Controller Robin Washer does not have the flight listed on her flight progress strips. For the next 40 seconds, she would be verifying this plane's identity, confirming squawk information and conversing with another controller in the tower. During this, US Air Flight 1493 flies over the end of runway 24 left and begins to land as normal. The pilots, those in the tower and those in the SkyWest plane, would have had no idea that disaster was imminent. US Air 1493 touches down at just before 6.07. 730 meters further down the runway, as the Boeing 737 lands, it collides with SkyWest 5569 in the rear. Immediately following the collision, Washer holds another aircraft from entering the runway. US Air 1493 is continuing down the runway, crushing SkyWest 5569 underneath it. Eventually, the two planes skid off of runway 24 left to the south of the runway, where they slow before colliding with an old abandoned fire station building, where they come to a rest before erupting in flames. 23 passengers and crew on board US Air 1493 died in the disaster. Most of those who were killed were sitting towards the front of the plane. Among the dead was Captain Colin Shaw. One flight attendant was also killed in the disaster. Most of the survivors were sitting at the rear and middle of the plane, where the resulting fire was less severe. Many escaped from the rear entry doors. The fate of those on board SkyWest 5569 was fatal, as all 12 of the people on board the small Metroliner perished as the plane was crushed beneath the larger Boeing plane, resulting in a death toll of 35. Once news spread to the tower that there were in fact two planes in amongst the wreckage, the search began to track down the missing plane. After conversing with departure controllers, SkyWest 5569 was deemed to be missing. It had become clear that the two planes were cleared to use the same runway at the same time. Controller Robin Lee Washer left the tower that evening and never worked as an air traffic controller again. In the following investigation, it was revealed that LAX air traffic control was understaffed. This was following another runway incursion event several months prior to the collision on runway 24 left. It was also revealed that a ground radar system which can display the movements of all planes and other airport vehicles was not functional on the night of the incident. In the aftermath, a new control tower was built at Los Angeles Airport. The new building is much taller with a more centralized location with a clear vantage point over the entire airport. The use of the runways also changed to LAX. The outside runways would now be primarily used for landing, while the inside runways would now be used for takeoff. This is now the usual practice at the airport. But have these improvements to the airport helped to decrease the number of runway incursions? In the years after the 1991 incident, runway incursions still occurred on what some would call a frequent basis. Major runway incursion events occurred in 2006 and 2007, but collisions between multiple aircraft in these incidents were narrowly avoided. Today, LAX is still one of the largest and busiest airports in the entire world. In the 2010s, Runway incursions at LAX were much less frequent. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. I am thrilled that you've made it to the end of the video. If you did enjoy this content, be sure to subscribe as there are new videos every Saturday. It is that time once again to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their continued support. If you would like to get your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, be sure to join. Tiers start from £3 per month, and you will also get early access to all new videos two days before they go out publicly. We now have so many patrons that I felt the need to change this layout of the end screen, so it's just one large scrolling box now. I think it looks quite clean, let me know what you think. Anyway, a thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Marie Innes, Pacman7, and Panic Chicken. Thank you all so much. And special thanks to my £10 patrons for their generous support as always. Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Mike Milton, Side Effect, and Will Tanner. 
Thank you all so much for your continued support. I owe you all big time. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.